All right, let's return to the example we were looking at last time where we had solved this. And in this case, I'm just putting just the minimum number of equations needed to solve for the mesh currents. So in this case, since the IA mesh was defined, like I said before, I'm not bothering to write that KVL equation. I'm just saying IA, goes, IA, is, equal to, IA is equal to 2 amps. That's the constraint. I write the constraint for the 1 amp. IB minus IC is 1 amp. And then I wrote the equations for the other two meshes. Now, it turns out we can simplify this a little bit better, make it a little bit, more, a little bit simpler, because in this case we have a situation where a current source is spanning two meshes. We call that a super mesh. And why is a super mesh important? Because KVL holds for a super mesh. So in this case, I can define a super mesh around those two meshes. or I'll just use SM. Let's write the KVL equation for that super mesh equation. So in this case, for my super mesh, I've got 5IA minus IB. That's a rise is equal to 10 volts, that's a drop, and then going back around, plus 6IC. And that's a drop. So in this case, I've got a super mesh equation, and just as I had before, I can still write the same two constraint equations. So in this case, my constraint equations are that IA is equal to 2 amps and IB minus IC is equal to 1 amp. Three equations, three unknowns. I can now solve for the three mesh currents. What is the super mesh equation? Well, before when we looked at supernode, we saw that the supernode equation was nothing more than the linear, basically the linear combination of two KCL equations. The super mesh equation is the linear combination of those two mesh equations. Notice VS is equal to IC, IC of 6IC. If I substitute, I get this. So this is nothing more than IC plus IB with VS2 eliminated. By substitution. And so super mesh equation enables us to eliminate the VS2 variable and then go through and just write one equation around the entire super mesh. And lets us, in effect, make a slightly simpler problem by combining the two original mesh equations for IB and IC. Now, once again, to emphasize, don't be distracted or fooled or confused by a book, a textbook that tries to make it seem as if you must use a super mesh equation. You don't. You can always solve any mesh analysis problem by defining the voltage across each current source and then writing the KVL equations. Clearly, this super mesh does save me a little bit of work. It lets me eliminate the VS2, but if you're not comfortable writing and using a super mesh equation, don't. 
I will never, just as with super nodes, I will never ask you to work a problem using super meshes. There's no need to do it if you don't want to do it. If you are comfortable using the super mesh, then by all means using it, use it. But if you don't feel comfortable, then don't. You can always just go through and do the technique just like this. So super mesh and super node together are both techniques and concepts where you are not required to use them, but you may find that uh, they will save you a little bit of time and effort as you become more skilled in nodal and mesh analysis. Now one other thing I want to mention or point out, and this is worth doing, I had a resistor here that spanned these two meshes. And you know, I always have students who ask, well, Dr. Holman, why did you pick this positive to negative? And I said, well, because the two currents were going in the opposite direction. And I always have students who will say, but Dr. Holman, what if it went the other way? It's a good question. What if I had chosen this way? Let's write the IB mesh equation with now the voltage drop in this direction, just to see what happens. So in this case, now that I've got the voltage drop defined like so, IB enters the correct direction, IA does not, so I've got to flip around and make this minus IA. So now I've got a voltage drop. So in this case, I've got for IB, I've got all voltage drops, so there are no rises. So zero for any rise is equal to five times IB minus IA plus 10 plus VS2. Look at this equation versus that equation. They're the same. I take this term, put it on the other side, change the sign, I get that equation. So it is truly completely arbitrary how you select the voltage drop if the two currents disagree. You will not get a wrong answer as long as you correctly express the voltage drop through that resistor in terms of the difference between the two currents. So just always like to kind of throw this in to illustrate that truly this stuff is arbitrary. You're not constrained in any particular polarity. And once again, also, you're not constrained in any particular direction. I could randomly make these clockwise, counterclockwise. All you're going to wind up is get a different form of the same equations where you put things on different sides of the equal sign, but you'll still get the same answer. Okay? Let's work one more problem. And in this case, let's do a problem that includes a dependent source. So let's work a problem where we have a dependent source, have, probably we have a current source which is dependent. So let's, let's do this. Okay, in this case, I've got a dependent voltage source, a voltage controlled current source, 2V1, where V1 is the voltage across that 5 ohm resistor. And I want to find V1. I've got two current sources, a current source that spans these two meshes, and I've also got a dependent current source that's on the edge of that mesh. So let's go through and let's first define our mesh currents. Now, because I've got this V1 voltage already defined for the problem, 
Let's go ahead and let's follow the path of sign convention for that resistor. There's no point in fighting that. I call it IA. Call this IB. Once again, arbitrarily chosen as clockwise. And IC. I'll choose that as clockwise as well. So in this case, we can now go through, define our voltage drops across all of our resistors. So for the, fi for the five, volt, uh, 5 ohm resistor, V1's already chosen. For the 3 ohm, I'm going to follow IB. For the 8 ohm, I've got two currents going in opposite directions. So once again, I can arbitrarily pick the polarity of the voltage across that 8 ohm resistor since IA and IC are entering in different ends. And here IB and IC are entering in different ends. So once again, the voltage drop I pick across that 10 ohm resistor is totally arbitrary. All right. Now in addition, because I have two current sources, I better define voltages across those current sources. I'm going to call this VS. And I'm going to call the voltage across this current source VVCCS for the voltage controlled current source. Okay, I've now got all the elements I need. Let's go through and let's write the KVL plus Ohm's law equations we're going to need. Okay, for IA, in this case, going around the loop. I'm going to have 5IA, and that's a drop. And then I've got 6 volts, which is a rise. Going in around the loop, that's a drop. So this will be 5IA plus 8 times, and once again, looking at this, IA goes in this way, IC goes that way. So if I've got IA this direction and IC in this direction, it's got to be minus IC entering in that direction. So it's going to be 8 times IA minus IC. And then continuing around, I've got VS, which is a rise. So drop, drop, rise, rise, going around this. Drop, rise, drop, rise. All right? That's for my IA mesh, IB mesh. For my IB mesh, starting in this corner going around, I've got 3 IB as a drop. I've got VS as a drop. And then I've got the voltage across this resistor, that's a rise. So that's equal to 10 times, in this case, IC minus IB. Okay, do I need to write the IC equation, the IC current equation? No, I don't. This current source defines that mesh. So I just need a constraint. My constraint is, is that IC must be equal to 2 times V1. That's all I need. In addition, there's another constraint. The 2 amp source constrains IB and IA. And as we can see, IB minus IA must be equal to 2 amps. So here are my two constraints for my two current sources, and mesh IC is defined. So I could write the KVL equation, but all I would be doing is adding an additional variable that I don't need. So in this case, I've now got one, two, three, four equations.
I've got one, two, three currents plus Vs. So I've got four equations, four unknowns. I can now go and solve. And if I solve, actually, hold on, I'm still missing something. Pardon me. There are five unknowns. Excuse me. Because I've got V1. So I have IA, IB, IC. I've got VS and I've got V1. What did I just forget? I've got a dependent source. I need a dependent source variable. Almost forgot. So you see, you've always got to remember that. KVL plus constraints plus DSV. What's the dependent source variable? V1 is equal to 5IA. The dependent source variable must be written in terms of mesh currents. Now, that's my fifth equation. Five equations, five unknowns, now I can solve. And if I do solve, what I'm going to get is that IA is equal to 0 0.130 amps. IB is equal to 2.13 amps. IC is equal to 1.30 amps. And V1 is equal to 0 0.649 volts. And there's my solution. All right, and so there's my V1. I wanted to find V1 when I started this, and there's my answer for V1 plus all the mesh currents, which means I can find any other voltage I want. Now, I could have also said, hey, there's a super mesh here. Clearly, That is a super mesh. So I could have written a super mesh which would have combined the IA and IB equations and eliminated VS. So if I wrote that super mesh, what would I get? For my super mesh equation, 3IB is a drop. Going around, plus 5IA is a drop. Six volt is a rise. Going around, I've got my eight times IA minus IC is a drop. Going around, that's a rise across the 10 ohm resistor. And so that's going to be equal to 10 times IC minus IB. And then back again to my starting point. So I wrote the KVL equa equation around the super mesh. And what do you know? In this case, once again, I have substituted to eliminate VS and combined those two equations to give me a super mesh equation. So I could write these two, or I could write that one. If I do this, I don't need the VS variable. And then, of course, I still need the two constraints. I still need the dependent source variable. And that gives me my answer. So here I just kind of put it all together. We noted that this current source, even though it was dependent, still defined the IC mesh. And once again, if I wanted to, I could write that IC mesh equation, KVL equation, if I wanted to. I would add one more equation, and I'd add one more variable. So I would, it wouldn't change the answers for the others, but it would tell me what V, 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 C, S is equal to, or V sub V, V, C, C, S. Okay? So, always remember, with mesh, what do you need to do? I need, in this case... KVL, plus I need my constraint equations, 
plus I need any dependent source variable equations. I'll add that together. That's my solution. So we notice the similarity between mesh and nodal analysis. I need a KVL or a KCL equation for each mesh or each node, then the constraints, then the dependent source variables. And if I write all of those equations correctly, then I will get a solution. I'll have a, a number of equations which is equal to the number of variables. Okay? So this uh, completes our review of mesh analysis, which as I said before, is very much of a mathematical duel to nodal analysis. Next time we will look at how we can compare nodal versus mesh. If I just give you a random problem, which technique do you use? That's a really good question. How do you choose the proper technique, given the fact that just about any circuit we're going to have in the class this semester could be solved either way? Which do you choose, nodal versus mesh? Next time we'll look at that and see how you can figure that out.